Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. We've got folks streaming in from the waiting room right now, so we'll get started in just a few seconds. Thanks for joining us. All right, let's wait just one more minute. Okay, well, let's get started and uh, a couple more people join us and they'll then they'll join us. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this next event in uh, Bud PR's education and engagement series and live Diasporica podcast recording. Uh, my name is Alberto Medina. I am the president of Bud PR. Um, I'm a writer, editor, advocate for, for Puerto Rico's independence, and I am really thrilled to be here and to be in conversation um, with my friend and colleague, Merari Fernandez, who is another leader of, of Bud PR and the host and creator um, and all around master of, of Diasporica, the <laughs> podcast. Um, and we are going to have an interesting conversation today, I hope, about Puerto Rican politics, U.S. politics, the upcoming elections on the island and and in the United States, and especially about um, Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the current resident commissioner of Puerto Rico, the pro-statehood candidate of Puerto Rico. Um, and we wanted to do this event more as a conversation because, um, well, we might say some things that uh, some some outside guests might not <laughs> want to say about, uh, about Jennifer Gonzalez or about Puerto Rican and, and US politics. Um, so thank you for for joining us. We hope you'll you'll enjoy the chat. As always, we'll we'll take questions from the audience at the end. So start thinking about them, um, add them to the chat or to the Q and A feature, and I will uh, pass it to to Merari to say a little more about today's topic. Hi everyone. I want to welcome everyone to this webinar and those who will be listening through the Asporica podcast, a podcast that aims to become a bridge and provide a political voice to the Puerto Rican diaspora. To stay connected with Diasporica, you can go to our website, diasporica.caproni.fm. Follow us on social media on Twitter at PR underscore Diasporica, or find us on Facebook. We're also on Stitcher, Amazon Music, Pandora, and Apple Podcasts. So in today's episode, we will talk about the current um, candidate that's running for governor, Jennifer Gonzalez, who represents Puerto Rico's for statehood and right-wing political party who currently is the non-voting resident commissioning, commissioner res, uh, representing Puerto Rico in Congress. Uh, the curious, curious or interesting thing about Jennifer is that she's also a Republican who endorsed Donald Trump in the past Republican convention. Um, if you don't know much about Puerto Rico's politics, some of you might be shocked with this mix of things of a Puerto Rican supporting statehood and Donald Trump, who does not support statehood for Puerto Rico, who was disrespectful to Puerto Ricans just after being hit by Hurricane Maria, uh, someone who openly discriminates against immigrants and Puerto Ricans. But in order to understand all of this mix of things, uh, Alberto and I want to provide some kind of uh, context uh, for those of you who don't understand how we got here in the first place and make sense of, of it. Um, including talking about the history behind the party that she represents, uh, the new progressive party. That That's my translation, my literal translation of it, uh, which supports statehood for Puerto Rico and other parties and actors. Um, so um, we, we want to uh, just talk a little bit about the different parties that are currently um and also the parties who have been in, uh, running Puerto Rico historically. So during the past 30 years, so we had the uh, New Progressive Party, we had the Popular the Democratic Party, and then we had the Pro-Independence Party, uh, which been um, in politics for more than 30 years. And they have ma mainly the, prog uh, the pro uh, New Progressive Party and the Democratic Party have uh, take uh, turns in terms of being in power and being the majority uh, in the House of Representatives and also in the Senate. Um, so eventually, after all of that time in power, there has been a shift in the last four, six, or eight years. And do these two main parties have lost power in terms of the amount of voters who are voting for them. Like, in the past, 
a party will win with 50, 52, like, uh, or more uh, percent of the votes. But like the last candidate, uh, it was around 33% of the vote, Alberto. Yes. So um, so that's a huge uh, shift, but also there has been some emer emergent parties like the uh, six, C Citizen Victory Movement and also uh, the Dignity Project, which we we're going to talk about later. Um, these are my direct translations, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> yeah. um, well, and, it, and always important to say when we're doing a, a direct translation of the Partido Nuevo Progresista or New Progressive Party that it's one of the, the great misnomers in, in Puerto Rican politics because there's nothing nothing progressive about it. So just like um like we say about the Estado Libre Asociado, which is Puerto Rico's commonwealth status that um literally translates to free associated state and Puerto Rico is neither free nor associated nor a state. Um yeah, that, that progressive part of the pro statehood party has never uh, quite been accurate and that's that's a lot of what we're gonna <laughs> talk about today. Uh, so we understand that at least in the U.S., there are two main political parties that have take turn, like the Republicans and the Democrats, and it, it's kind of like people see them as the liberals and the conservatives. Uh, but in Puerto Rico, is a uh, is 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 different. Um, we have these three parties, and that two of them have been taking turns, and um, they are basically conservative in nature, like the progressive party is even more conservative, I would say. But in the in the last years, like the, the main two parties have been conservative in, in kind of like in the same way so some some people might say. Um, and then the people from the pro-independence body, they tend to be more lefty and more, you know, more on the left in terms of like issues. So is there anything else that we need to say about the those three main parties, Alberto, that we, we, we think is important to say before we move on? Yeah, I think, you know, the one of the big sort of context and, and subtext to a lot of this is and why it can be very confusing, especially if you're looking to draw comparisons with U.S. parties or with Democrats and, and Republicans, et cetera, is that, you know, the three main parties that have dominated Puerto Rican politics um define themselves based on their um mm -hmm. their stance their position on Puerto Rico status so the, the so-called new progressive party right the pro statehood party the pro status quo party and the independence party um and within those parties you can have and and there often you know are uh people of different political ideologies on the left right spectrum i think merari's right that um especially the pro statehood party and to some extent the the pro status quo you know popular democratic party um do tend to be more more conservative um you know not everyone i would i would put it this way not everyone in the pro statehood party is a republican but if you are a republican in puerto rico you are probably in the in the statehood party and we saw this um you know earlier this this summer in the um in the republican national convention um but you know this this is where a lot of the really interesting dynamics and um and you might consider sort of ironies come from the fact that you have parties that aren't really organized on an ideological spectrum even though they do have um you know share certain um certain positions and ideologies they are organized around this different question and then you know what does that mean when that um, reality sort of um, butts heads with U.S. politics, which whatever you can say about how <laughs> how close or how different the, the Democrats and, and Republican parties are at this point, um, it's certainly a different, um, yeah, a different way to kind of to kind of organize parties. I also want to say just you know as, um, as part of this conversation and and for Bud PR, you know, we're here talking about political parties, um, about electoral politics. Um, we are not endorsing or asking people to vote for or against any candidate or any political party. Um, you know, I think we we have eyes and ears and we see some realities that are <laughs> that are worth discussing, especially um, when we believe that they affect and, and will affect, you know, Puerto Ricans on, on the island and in the diaspora. And we recently had a whole other event about about this topic. Um, but our goal is really to help people understand what I was just talking about when Merari began to talk about, you know, what are these dynamics that happen between U.S. and Puerto Rican politics? Um, you know, what are some of the things that you might not expect could 
be true that somehow are true when when U.S. politics meets Puerto Rican politics. So um, that's really kind of the the, the framing behind um, behind these conversations. And also, I think before we move on, just to make it clear, I think you try to talk about or you, you talk about how the political political parties are positioned in base on or, or based on um, the political status of Puerto Rico. So the new progressive party supports statehood. Uh, the Democratic uh, Party uh, supports the current Commonwealth, and the pro-independence party supports the independence of Puerto Rico. And historically, these two, the, the main two parties, the first two that I mentioned, uh, they've been part of the um, the political structure in which um, uh, they kind of like oppress, put on the side, like put to the side the, the pro-independence movement and individuals and politicians. Um, so sometimes we, we wonder why so many people support statehood, but we need to understand also the repression that was in place against pro-independence, people who supported pro-independence. So I just wanted to bring that before we start talking about who Jennifer Gonzalez is, because Jennifer Gonzalez, uh, she is part of the uh, new progressive party that supports statehood for Puerto Rico. So what, what can we say about Jennifer Gonzalez, Alberto? <laughs> I was telling Alberto before we started. I have, I have, I came unprepared. I have nothing to say about Jennifer <laughs> Gonzalez. <laughs> yeah, because there's so much out there. So, um, this time. Well, about it, yeah. I mean, it's funny. In in some ways, there's so much, and in some ways, there's there's so little when you think about you know what she has done and, and is doing in Congress. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But, um, you know, Jennifer Gonzalez is a lifelong politician, a lifelong, um, you know pro-statehood or a member of that, you know, pro-statehood party, PNP, um, and a lifelong Republican. So um, she is currently the resident commissioner of, of Puerto Rico, has been since 2016. Um, you know, before that, she was a leader in in the House of Representatives in, in Puerto Rico, you know, speaker of the House of Representatives, minority leader. Um, you know, she was president of, the, of her party. She was vice president. president. Of, yes, vice president of her party, mm -hmm. you know. Um, she was now now she's president because she's the candidate for governor and you know <laughs> the candidate for governor becomes the um the, the the leader of the party of course um she was also the president for many years of the of the puerto rican um republican party um in in so far as that's an, a, a real thing uh, but it but it is and, and she was president of it um so you know she's someone who has been in politics for um, for most of her life, she was actually a fairly, you know, young legislator when she was, um, when she was first elected. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of interesting conversations right now in the context of the election in Puerto Rico, where, you know, as as candidates have to do in Puerto Rico when things aren't going well, which they, they usually never are, they have to say, well, you know, I'm going to come in and fix it. And I'm the one who's going to do things differently. And, you know, the people who have come before have failed, and I'm, I'm going to bring in the, you know, everything that's needed. Um, but she's someone who, you know, first in the Puerto Rican House of House of Representatives and, and, and in Puerto Rico, and now, you know, for eight years as a quote unquote congresswoman, you know, resident commissioner, um, just for, for folks who don't know, is a, a rep Puerto Rico's representative who has no vote in uh, on in on the floor of Congress, can only vote in committee, can, you know, introduce legislation and do all these things, but cannot actually vote on legislation. Um, you know, she is someone who has been one of Puerto Rico's main political leaders for for the past twenty years. Um, I think that there's something important to mention about Jennifer Gonzalez. First of all, I don't think we, t we told the audience why we want to talk about her in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why do we take a whole episode to talk about Jennifer Gonzalez? And um, I think, first of all, she's running for governor of Puerto Rico now in this year, uh, 2024. Um, the elections are on November 5th, just like in the U.S., um, and, and she has a particular agenda that we want to discuss here in terms of how she sees the relationship uh, between Puerto Rico and the U.S. And since we are a political organization, we, we find that, that it's important to, to, to talk about. Um, and things are like, there is a historic shift happening right now in politics, and she happens to be one of the main contenders. And the shift has to do with 
like there are people who are moving towards the left of the spectrum or at least are considering different kinds of political parties. But she represents the, the status quo party that, you know, she wants to stay like the political party that wants to stay in place. Um, so something important to say about Jennifer is that also she, as a Republican, she co-share co -share Latinos for Trump. So I participated like one time I went to an event from the Republican Party and that says Latino for Trump. I just wanted to see, you know, what's going on. And suddenly I see Jennifer Gonzalez hosting this event. I was like, wow. So she was a co-chair of Latinos for Trump. When the uh, insurrection happened on June 6th, she said that she did not support Donald Trump. So I was surprised about her, you know, not backing Donald Trump at that point which is not surprising in the sense that she didn't want to be seen negatively because in Puerto Rico, when the, those news, uh, you know, the, the Puerto Ricans saw the news of the insurrection, um, it, it would look really bad on her to support Trump. But now she supported him again. It seems like apparently in the news, you know, um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, maybe she thinks it wouldn't look that bad at this point to support him again because people forgot about the insurrection. It's not in people's minds. Um, so this is, this is Jennifer Gonzalez at this point. There's more that we can say about her, right, Alberto? Yeah. But what, I think, yeah, we'll we... probably say much, say much more as we, as we continue okay. the, the conversation. But, um, but I mean, that last point is really important. I think that, you know, she was, she was for him before she was against him before she was for him um and i think um yeah I, it speaks to you know i think convictions or or like they're rough and and maybe it speaks a little bit to this to this interesting question of like you know what does what does she actually want believe and and how does that connect to um to the parties in puerto rico to the parties in the us and to ultimately you know what she might do or not do in in power so maybe it might be good like we it might be good to start talking about her relationship to the Republican Party, her actions in Congress, and her support for Trump. We already like kind of talk a little bit about that, about her support for Trump, and somehow her relationship with the Republican Party. Are there any actions that have taken place in Congress, Alberto? Yeah, I mean her, you know, her support for Trump. I always say, and there's this article people can um, can look up. Actually, I had looked that up to to put it in the chat because i think it's it's one of the more incredible um headlines that you could ever read about puerto rico and and really hurtful and and insulting um this was a usa today you know article from from 2017 from just a month after hurricane maria in which jennifer gonzalez is quoting as saying that trump has given puerto rico everything that it that it needed and and wanted after after hurricane maria um i think anyone with uh any memory, knowledge, common sense <laughs> would recognize that um, that that's so far from the truth that it's it's hard to find the, the words to to describe it honestly. Um, so I think it it speaks to this um, to this idea that you know in a moment where I think Jennifer Gonzalez um, had to choose between putting you know Puerto Ricans first and putting her allegiance to to Donald Trump and to the Republican Party first. Um, we saw what what she chose. Um, so I think I think that's quite telling. I think it's it's quite damning. Um, you know, she has as we just talked about. Um, but depending on the the story of the day and and her political convenience, you know, wavered a little bit in uh, in that um, in in the last few few years. But it's back to being a um, a Trump supporter, you know, as recently as the Republican convention, as Merari mentioned, gave interviews saying that, you know, she believed that Trump was the best for, for Puerto Rico, which again, it's incredibly hard to, to sit here and, and even fathom how, how someone could, could say that, um, which by the way, is not an endorsement of, you know, <laughs> just like we say, we're not telling people who to vote for in, in Puerto Rico, you know, it, it saying that Trump has been and would be terrible for Puerto Rico is not an endorsement of the of the alternative because we we've talked about and will continue to talk about some of the ways that uh, Democrats have also um, you know failed Puerto Ricans and and continue to 
but it's again really hard to sit here and and wrap our heads around how someone could think that you know Trump gave everything uh, that Puerto Ricans needed after Hurricane Maria and that he's the best choice for for Puerto Ricans in 2024. So you know I think that says a lot about who who Jennifer Gonzalez is um, and as far as her you know what she's done in Congress. Um, the reality is not a whole lot. I mean, part of that is just the nature of the beast of her position as resident commissioner, which is so powerless, right? Um, but I was I was looking up the the you know her actual performance in in Congress before this conversation. Again, she's been there for four terms now since 2016, two year terms. Um, she's introduced 156, I believe, pieces of legislation, and one of them has become law. So one out of 156, and the only law that she herself introduced, not things that she jumped on or, or co-sponsored, but the only law that she herself introduced and passed um, was a law to rename a post office in Puerto Rico um, after the, the 65th Infantry Regiment. So, you know, when you hear politicians like her and then, you know, a lot of the basis of her campaign and of the campaigns of all the former resident commissioners who have run for governor in Puerto Rico about how they're th getting things done for Puerto Rico in Congress, about how they're like, getting all this, you know, federal funding for Puerto Rico. Um, you know, some of that may happen without her uh, being the one to introduce the bills or without her votes because she can't vote for anything on the on the floor. Um, but it's a pretty thin legislative record to to say the least. Um. I think we can also talk about in terms of Hurricane Maria, uh, how she went to TV, to the TV to talk about uh, her support about Donald Trump candidly. She has no problem supporting him. And and she somehow developed uh, or a narrative or an explanation for why he threw paper towels at Puerto Ricans. Mm. And... And she said that he, he was throwing other things, food and other stuff, and paper towels was one of them. And that it was it was not ill, Ill intention, but it was a bias of the media. So uh, somehow, you know, she thinks that the media was just making it a big deal. And that's how it became like, oh, you know, Trump was throwing paper towels at Puerto Ricans. And it just, it just made, it, they made him look bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there is this nature in terms of the relationship of uh, Puerto Rico with the U.S. that that we can talk about later today. But it's like some of the pro statehood like leaders they tend to kind of bend over or like be very submissive with whoever is in power, no matter if it's Demo Democrat or Republican. So when a Republican comes to Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and minimizes them, the dead toll after the hurricane and i remember ricky rosello said it was 12 he was like oh that's not that bad you know in <laughs> katrina you know we had thousands and thousands of deaths uh yeah. so and they wouldn't say anything they wouldn't like um confront donald trump about this uh insensitivity you know lack of sensitivity um so jennifer gonzalez is, is the same so she will not confront, or she doesn't confront Donald Trump about anything, you know, because they think that they need to be in their best, best behavior in order to get the federal funds. Otherwise, Trump will, will help, will hold the money as he did actually after Hurricane Maria. Yeah. And it um, doesn't work. I mean, just really quickly, and I, I remember having this conversation or, um, over Facebook or something with a, an old friend of mine who, when Jennifer Gonzalez was elected resident commissioner in 2016, and of course, Trump and the Republicans win the election as well, um, my friend said, well, you know, I don't necessarily like Jennifer Gonzalez. I definitely don't like the Republicans, but this will be good at least, right? Because she's a Republican and they're Republicans. And that'll mean that, you know, uh, Republicans in Congress will pay more more attention to to Puerto Rico. And again, this was 2016. The hurricane mm -hmm. is, is a year later. And I don't think, you know, since since 2017, um, there, there's, there's been much attention paid to, to Puerto Rico. Um, well, by all of Congress, but, but certainly um, by Republicans. So... Um, you know this this idea of, of oh if we like are nice to them and tell them we're great and belong to their party um that's gonna be what really helps uh puerto ricans which 
is as as you as you appropriately called it is, is submissive and kind of shameful um you know in and of itself but you could at least excuse it if it were effective but it doesn't even work <laughs> it doesn't well, help us at all but that sounds like the idea of a simulation like in a simulation you have to become like the master that like the people who who live previously in that country um and I, that's the rhetoric or the narrative that the first stated patty uh, conveys to to their followers and what Jennifer Gonzalez does and what Ricky Rosselló did or keep, keeps doing. I think he recently wrote a book, uh, yeah. Ricky Rosselló, yeah, yeah. in which he praises Donald Trump here and, you know, in all those pages, you know, and, and you think, okay, you as a Puerto Rican who was denigrated as a Puerto Rican in front of, like he was denigrated. I, I felt like the interactions with Donald Trump between uh, Donald Trump and Ricky Rosselló were very uh, racist you know, and in terms of like minimizing Puerto Ricans, minimizing Ricky Rosselló's power. And still he writes a book about Donald Trump and praising him and how amazed he was to be in his presence and working with him and his talents and his leadership skills. This is what all the leadership in the new progressive party does and what Jennifer Gonzalez is all about. Well, and let me ask you, and maybe this is a good way to, to transition <laughs> to kind of our next topic, because this is sort of your this is sort of your field, your area of expertise is, you know, psychologically, how do we explain that? You know, how does how does it happen um, or how do you think, you know, folks like Jennifer Gonzalez um, or like Ricky Rosselló um, justify in their minds um, you know, responding to humiliation with with praise and with with loyalty. Um, you know what? <laughs> how is oh, how yeah. is that possible in <laughs> in the in the colonized mind of I'm, I don't want to give away the answer, but in the, in the colonized mind of, of Puerto Ricans? Well, if you live in a country that gets a message that you are less than, you are not good enough uh, as the master as U USAers, as Americans, USAers, uh, you will believe less of yourself and also you will believe the ideology that comes with it, which is that you need to do, you know, what the master tells you to do and you need to think about yourself in that particular way. And so you become a servant of the master and also you think that in that, in that dynamic, you want to have what the master has. And the only way to attain that is to become like the master. So you have to acquire the ideology, the way of being, the way of looking at life. That's why the progressive party, the new progressive party, they represent, they represent this ideology of the, not only capitalism, but like the nasty, like the capitalism, like the, the, the one that doesn't care about anyone because that's what the US represents for them. Like if you think about, the new progressive party, they they want to be like the U.S. They want Puerto Rico to be like another state, but become like the U.S. and assimilate because they feel it will give them also uh, value. It will give us value as people because they are the value, the value or the valuable people. What you know, like they are the ones who have value. So we want to have value like them. We have in internalized that idea that we don't have value. So in order to become valuable, we have to become like them. So we have to speak English. We have to assimilate. We have to do everything like that country does. Like we have to, to change the healthcare system. We Before we had um, more of a, like a, a state-based healthcare system, gover government-led healthcare system. So they thought we had to be like the U.S. So now we have a privatized health healthcare system that is not is not good at this point. It, it doesn't serve the people of Puerto Rico, or the same thing they want to do with the education, the uh, educational system, the system of education, or the Department of Education. They want it to be like more like the U.S., more privatized and having all the charter schools. Um, so it's basically assimilating society or Puerto Rican society to the U.S. because of how they feel about themselves, but also because they, if they if they help society to do that, they will accommodate themselves, th themselves in that society 
and they will be able to have the goods and the material and the money that the master has. No, I, I think mean, that's that's kind of yeah. like a general explanation. <laughs> no, I think that's that's an incredibly insightful and, and important explanation, and it does start to I think to provide an answer to this question of how is it possible that a candidate like Jennifer Gonzalez or a party like the pro-statehood party for whom statehood is their raison d'etre, right? Their whole thing as a party, as a movement, the main and you know, offer and the main um towards position that they that they bring to the electorate. Um, you know, how is it possible to be that and also to be a Trump supporting Republican, which, you know, we could spend the next hour talking about the ways that the Republican Party um historically but even more so currently has has opposed um puerto rican statehood um you know i think some people may have seen a couple of, of months ago that uh the republican party removed any mention of um of puerto rico status from its party platform um incredibly it was the uh, statehood was actually on the party platform for um several decades which says something about the <laughs> about the value of party platforms because certainly the Republican Party or the Democratic Party didn't move on on statehood in, in all of this time. Um, but it was there, right? And people could point to it and say, okay, technically, you know, on paper at least the Republican Party supports statehood. That's gone. Um, you know, you have Republican leaders who um are now using the issue of Puerto Rico statehood as an attack at and, and on the stump. And you have, you know, Mitch McConnell calling it socialism. And, you know, they will literally give speeches where they say we cannot let the Democrats win because the Democrats will give Puerto Rico statehood and that will be a complete, you know, disaster for for our country. Um, Trump himself during the Republican primary or, you know, <laughs> what little Republican primary there was before Trump you know, dominated the the field as he completed again his his takeover of the Republican Party. Donald Trump took out an ad in Iowa against Ron DeSantis, accusing Ron DeSantis of supporting statehood for Puerto Rico, um, which wasn't really true. It was based on the fact that DeSantis, as a congressman, you know, had supported one of these bills that went nowhere. That you know, specified there should be another plebiscite. And, you know, these are things uh, politicians in Florida do to try to get, um, you know, support from Puerto Rican voters in the state. But, um, you know, I think it's incredibly clear now that, um, and I, I wrote a piece about this um, for the Latino newsletter that people can check out. We're in a new era of how Republicans talk about and treat Puerto Rico status, where they used to pretend at least that they were open to the idea of Puerto Rican statehood, and now they are deathly, deathly opposed to it. Um, so it it's definitely a, a contradiction to to have someone who believes in statehood support, you know, a party that comes out and say statehood is a complete disaster and we will never ever allow it. And I think you know what you're talking about um, in terms of that desire to to assimilate and. Um, and to sort of achieve power because you see yourself as powerless because colonialism has told you that you're powerless and, and made you powerless is is one part of the of the explanation mm -hmm. um so and i think we, we need to also mention we have mentioned this in other episodes and webinars but we are not demonizing the republican party because they don't support statehood for puerto rico Maybe they don't do it for the right, you know, they don't support it for the right reasons, that maybe there are racist reasons behind it, their lack of support. But that that's not the point that we want to convey. And also, just because the Democrat, Democratic Party supports statehood is not like something that, for example, Boricua Unidos will support either, you know. Um, yeah, I always say it's uh, a, a broken uh, clock is twice a day situation. You know, <laughs> we think that Republicans are accidentally right about not wanting statehood for Puerto Rico for you know for very bad reasons. Yeah, so our organization or Puerto Rico en la Diaspora has has always openly supported independence for Puerto Rico, and part of these webinars is for us to be able to put the word out there and educate. The American public also about that there are other people who support other other political positions. And so maybe in terms of talking about Jennifer Gonzalez, uh, it's difficult to understand, you know, like what you were saying, Alberto, about reconciling the fact that 
upper state politician is a Republican and a Trump supporter. But yesterday I did some homework and I sat through the uh, the presidential debate. And as I was listening to the debate, I noticed that there were some sound bites or talking points from Donald Trump uh, towards Kamala um, and towards the Democratic Party that sounded so much like what um, the new progressive party, the party of Jennifer Gonzalez will say to the emergent and the pro-independence party. You know, and one of them was that Kam Kamala Harris is a Marxist, according to Trump. Uh, and we will end up being like Cuba and Venezuela. He said that yesterday at the presidential debate, and we laugh because we have heard that so much during the last three or four weeks in Puerto Rican politics, in which the pro-statehood party has been accusing the pro-independence party and the uh, citizen movement, um, citizen victory movement, which is the alliance or la alianza, of being a communist and that they just want Puerto Rico to become like Cuba or Venezuela and that communism will take over. These are all talking points from Jennifer Gonzalez. She blatantly, blat, you know, openly says that on TV and social media about the other political parties. Um, and so they, they accuse uh, the alliance or the, the two um, political parties as a bunch of Marxists and communists that will take over the country. Um, so they somehow ignore the relationship, wanting to be part of the U.S., but at the same time, ignore the relationship and the nature of the relationship between the, the U.S. and Puerto Rico, which that relationship will prevent any kind of change to the political structure of Puerto Rico. Yeah, and you were talking about this earlier in the, you know, in, in this sort of individual or, or micro thing of, of not wanting to challenge or, or, you know, acting submissive toward, um, toward people like Donald Trump towards, I think, American politics, politicians and, and leaders in general. And I think this is a real problem of the statehood movement and, and what it should really um, make us ask ourselves is how much does the pro statehood party or the pro statehood movement actually want statehood um or what are they willing to do and not do to to get it because you know if i if i were jennifer gonzalez or if i were a pro statehood leader um i don't know how i could you know but beyond all this psychological stuff that we're talking about i don't know how i could align with someone who um you know wants nothing to do with and and openly um hates my main political ideology right um Maybe maybe Jennifer Gonzalez would say that her main political ideology is in statehood and she has other concerns and ideas and statehood is just, as, as someone said in the chat, you know, what she um, says and then talks about in, in Puerto Rico because that's how um, that's how the statehood party traditionally wins elections in Puerto Rico by talking about status and about statehood and um, and making that their, their main point. Um, but, you know, it's a real... Like, Puerto Rico's political status, its colonial status, is 126 years old. Um, I think that tells us everything we know about how hard it is to change. And it is even harder to change if the people in power aren't willing to raise their voices, frankly, and speak, you know, in a little louder to the United States and confront them, as you as you said, with um, with colonialism and with their failures to um, to address the the status issue. Um, and it's very hard to think of someone like like Jennifer Gonzalez doing that, um, not just to Trump, but to anybody in, in U.S. politics, because um, and I, again, it's, it's so hard to get away from this, you know, the, the, the psychology of it. Um, you know, these these are folks who don't want to bite the hand that feeds them mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. they see, you know, the U.S. as that hand. Um, and and I just don't think they have it in them to take a, a position that um would would challenge the u.s would with um with the status would you know forcefully denounce colonialism and at the end mm -hmm. of the day that's what it's going to take because you know i've always said if if the pro-statehood movement signals to to the united states and to the u.s government that they are willing to wait forever 
you know, yes. for yes. <laughs> for for uh -huh. them to change Puerto Rico status, then forever is exactly as long as they are mm -hmm. going to make us wait. And that's why we're on, on year 126. So, you know, this this dynamic that we're talking about between Jennifer Gonzalez and Trump or the Republican Party is sort of an individual or, you know, um, example of of this much bigger dynamic that really has a lot to do with why we're still a colony. But at the same time, um, you know, there's this contradiction in terms of like, as you're saying, like they want statehood for Puerto Rico. Jennifer Gonzalez wants statehood for Puerto Rico, but they don't have the backbone to challenge the US about it. So the status is not ever going to change. So everything they're going to do in Puerto Rico about this presidential vote in November is just, it's not going to do anything, right? Because uh, they, say, they, they said that we will send this message to the U.S. that Puerto Rican people want statehood, but that's not how you do it. Um, but at the same time, there are these ways in, in which the New Progressive Party and Jennifer Gonzalez are so similar to the Republican Party. And, and you know, like, they are not going to give you statehood. They're not going to support statehood Puerto Rico. But they think so similarly, uh, which is interesting. I think I said earlier how the pro-statehood movement, want, uh, the things that they take on about the U.S. or that they emulate or want to be like are usually the more repressive, the more conservative views of the Republican Party. And besides this ideology that, you know, the left are Marxist and communist, they also implement voting repression tactics, just like in the US with African American and people of color, to the sector of the population that will likely not, will not vote for, for them, which is the young people. So in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico, the New Progressive Party closed registration voting centers they changed their electoral law and she probably assumes it as you know like she and the new progressive party they talk about you know how they have changed the electoral law like this is a good thing to do but but the, the this this change in the law also prevent other parties to be in areas of supervision around the election time that that will prevent fraud during the election time um so it's not that we want to say like the Republican Party says, oh, there is fraud in the election. It's not it's not the same thing in terms of like we seeing things where they are not. Like we are seeing like really bad things happening in Puerto Rico in terms of the uh, uh, 2024 election that makes us suspect about suspect about the the the, poss the possible a possible fraud that that could happen. So you know, like th these are things that maybe it feels incongruent that Jennifer Gonzalez and the pro independence party, uh, I'm sorry, Jennifer Gonzalez and party. the pro <laughs> the new progressive party support uh, the, the mainly uh, most of, I, I can say all of them, but most of them support the Republican party. It might not make sense, but in ideology, they want to be part of the U.S., but within that ideology of conservative being a conservative state. And this is the thing about Democrats, that they think that if we become a state, they're going to have two, two uh, Democrats. And for us who are Puerto Ricans and who see the po uh, political situation in Puerto Rico, we're not that sure that we're going to have Democrats if we become a state. Yeah, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think... When Puerto Rico status changes, um, and I say when because I don't, you know, I, I don't think we can have the luxury of, of saying if we need to, um, you know, keep fighting for it so that it happens sooner rather than later. Um, I think when Puerto Rico status changes, there's going to be such a huge political realignment um, <clears throat> in so many ways, you know, ideologically and otherwise that it's, it's very hard to predict, you know, um, whether... Puerto Rico would send Democrats or Republicans or, or both to, to Congress. I think Republicans are going to remain convinced that Puerto Ricans would send Democrats to, to Congress because we're brown people and because that's how, you know, brown people vote in the United States. Um, and that's kind of all they that's kind of all they need to know. Um, so in, in that sense, I think the, the perception is, is more important than the than the hypothetical future reality. And, and it's one of the big reasons why Republicans oppose, oppose statehood. Um, 
but I think you're right that there's, you know, th there is sort of an orientation and I think of it as a, it's, it's kind of an orientation to power and a desire for power, which, you know, to, to some extent all politicians have. Um, but I think it's a desire to power or for or desire for power and a willingness to, you know, oppress and repress and suppress <laughs> to, to get power and to keep power that, um, you know, some and many, you know, conservative members of, of the pro-statehood party and the pro-status quo party to some extent um, hold that is very similar to how we see, you know, um, people like like Donald Trump and, and other Republicans, um, and again, some Democrats <laughs> operate in, in the United States. And I think what a lot of the, you know, people like Jennifer Gonzalez and the pro-statehood Puerto Ricans don't realize, and this is the part that um, is almost tragic, is that, you know, they are some of the people, even as they want to be like the Donald Trumps of the world, they are exactly the people who the Donald Trumps of the world want and need to oppress <laughs> mm -hmm. to keep power. Um, you know, they are never going to be on the other side of that. Um, at least, you know, they collectively as a people, you may have a handful of folks and, and Jennifer Gonzalez may think that she's one of them because she got to be in, in Congress. Um, you know, you may have a handful of people that can at least rub elbows with the likes of Donald Trump, although I'm sure that they're <laughs> they're still looking down on them. Um, but collectively, um, I don't think Puerto Ricans, um, even the most um, assimilationist or the ones who, you know, try their hardest to get to that, um, to, to become like, like their masters, are ever going to be um, seen as anything but, you know, people that, um, that these U.S. leaders, you know, step on to to achieve, you know, what they what they want to achieve, um, and that really is, I think, a, a tragic consequence of of colonialism. That um, again gets back to this point of your worth or your idea of your worth being tied to your to your oppressor. You know, something I want to mention um, in terms of what uh, what we have said, what does that say about what we have said about Jennifer Gonzalez? What what does that mean in terms of the ideology behind the Puerto Rican statehood movement? And mm. and I think uh, the first thing I talk, I think about which we haven't mentioned, is the issue of women's rights, and how you know she's a woman, and we can say, well, we have a woman who is running for governor, like inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. But it's what kind of values does that person uh, embody and conveys to the people of Puerto Rico? And I can tell you from my perspective as a Puerto Rican woman and somebody who works with domestic violence survivors, sexual assault survivors, uh, that I don't, haven't seen anything meaningful that Jennifer Gonzalez has done about women's rights and the women's, and the women's movement in Puerto Rico uh, women's rights movements in Puerto Rico. And she's aligned to a political party who basically shares the same values, unfortunately. Also, the idea that she and her, her and her party are willing to bend over and sacrifice our people in exchange of, of political favors that make them look good and win elections. I think I'm, I'm frozen or you're frozen. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. If you, if you can hear me, please keep the, the conversation going without me. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry about that, folks. A little technical difficulty, but I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks for letting me know in the chat that you could hear me. No, I think she. I think um, that's. I think that's right. And and in, in Jennifer Gonzalez's case, two political parties that, that haven't done much for um for women's rights or, or are actively oppressing you know women and um and minorities and and everyone's rights. And I mean, God, I God, God bless you for watching that debate yesterday because I couldn't uh, <laughs> I couldn't bring myself to do it. But I I heard and read enough about you know um the the kinds of things that 
were said about immigrants and um you know the the greatest hits of of some of the more ras you know rancid and um and you know as we put in the title of this event frankly fascist um tendencies of of folks like like trump and and his movement so um and and i you know what you said at the beginning too is really important um you know it's not enough to and I, I was listening to someone else in puerto rican politics talk about this the other day you know it's not enough to actually i was listening to it on your podcast it's not enough to just be a woman if you're not going to fight for women right it's not mm -hmm. enough to um just have the identity piece without um actual ideological and political commitments that might um stem from your identity might arise from it but that's you know just being a woman doesn't make you a pro woman um candidate um and i would say by the way just being a puerto rican doesn't make you a pro puerto rican <laughs> politician and i think we have a lot of examples um yeah of of people who are like that and this is something too that you know our, our american friends and allies and and audience hopefully um need to understand that um because i at least what i've encountered in, in conversations with people about you know politics is um oh it's great Puerto Ricans, diversity. Um, yay, we love it. We don't really care who they are, what they think, what their positions are, what they've done. You know, we are just nice brown faces that help with the diversity statistics and you can put us on the ads. I mean, Kamala Harris put an ad out um, in which uh, that featured her visit to Puerto Rico and she was, she was there standing next to Pedro Pierluisi who who may identify as a Democrat, but I don't think anybody would um, identify as a as a champion of <laughs> of the people and of the oppressed and all of the things that you know that the Harris campaign is is rightly or, or wrongly trying to represent. So um, you know, this is a, a bit of a call to to Americans too to you know go beyond the face and the name and the ethnicity and find out what these people actually believe in and who they are and what they support. Um, not just if they're, you know, the, the, uh, a woman or a man or um, or white or Latino, because ultimately that matters a lot more. So what do you think, Alberto, will mean for Puerto Rico if Jennifer Gonzalez wins the election? What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can we can split the question up and, and you can talk about what may happen in, in Puerto Rico. And, um, you know, I, I was speaking with someone the other day about what I think may happen in in congress and in terms of of puerto rico's status um you know you mentioned earlier that there's going to be another another plebiscite another non-binding plebiscite in in puerto rico this this november um we can have a whole other conversation about the plebiscite and whether it's it's a good idea this will be the eighth non-binding if i'm not mistaken the um, seventh or eighth in in our history um mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a real possibility that Jennifer Gonzalez will win the election. There's a real possibility that statehood will will win the plebiscite. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what will happen is nothing in terms of Puerto Rico status, because this is essentially what we already saw in 2020. Um, a, a, you know, victory with all of the caveats and qualifications that <laughs> the 2020 vote deserves, but a victory for statehood, a victory for a pro-statehood governor, um, you know, Democrats who were all supposedly in favor of statehood in Congress. Um, and they basically cast statehood aside the very, you know, in the very, in the very first few weeks or months of of mm -hmm. the new Congress. I mean, there was a, a pro statehood act. Nobody even remembers it or talks about it anymore. That's how quickly it was discarded. Um, but there was an actual statehood admission act presented in Congress. Um, and, you know, it got thrown by the, by the wayside and we ended up with this Puerto Rico status act. So, um, you know, I think we'll be in a situation where that kind of legislation wouldn't move for all of the reasons and impediments that it has in, in U.S. politics. And I think we'll be in a situation with either Democrats or Republicans in charge um, where a governor, Jennifer Gonzalez, you know, might make a show of saying, oh, statehood, we need it. And, you know, U.S., you have to take action on this. But are is she going to meaningfully challenge and confront the U.S. government, um, and especially if it's a President Trump, with our colonial status in a way that that actually, you know, moves this issue forward. 
I, I very much doubt it. Um, but yeah, so I think that's that's what I see happening in, in Washington. And I don't know what how, how much you, you feel like you can say about what a governor Jennifer Gonzalez would mean for, for Puerto Rico. Bueno. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Luma Energy will continue mm. in Puerto Rico. So we we're gonna continue we we're gonna continue having like blackouts. Uh and which and all of what that implies, you know, in terms of healthcare, the healthcare system. Like I, I saw a video the other day at a hospital, there was no electricity and they had no generator and somebody was, you know, at the hospital, like hospitalized at a hospital with no electricity. You know what, what, what that means for the patient and for the doctors. Um, and for the elderly, elderly people who are at, at, at home, during these heat waves in Puerto Rico, suffocating, you know, of uh, all the, the, you know, how how hot it is in Puerto Rico right now. In terms of women's rights, we're not going to see that much being done by uh, the leadership of Jennifer Gonzalez, even though she's a woman. Uh, she represents the most conservative values for women right now. Um, so... If there's anything coming from the Supreme Court uh, taking away any kind of rights that have been gained in the past 30, 40 years, she will support that. She will bend over and she will masochistically accept whatever you know the president of the United States or, or the Congress decides about Puerto Rico or about any, any political any policy that imp is implemented or affected or affects Puerto Rico either it being Kamala or Trump you know being in power either even if you know it doesn't matter who is in power Kamala or Trump uh, also I noticed this hypocrisy right now uh, with the campaign uh, of Kamala, like all this, like, like there are some Democrats in the Pro New Progressive Party, and I don't know if this has to do with Jennifer Gonzalez, right? But but some Democrats in the New Progressive Party are all, been, you know, like supporting Kamala and Kamala this and Kamala that, but it's a new thing that's happening. I never saw them supporting Kamala right uh, in the past. You know, so I just feel like whoever is running or at the forefront, we're going to support that person no matter what as Puerto Ricans, just for the sake of getting like federal funds or getting some deals or some contracts or whatever, you know, like it's not genuine. Um, um, something that I noticed also on um, Puerto Ricans, New Progressive Party voters, is that they don't care if Jennifer Gonzalez is a Trumper. <laughs> uh, they they just support Jennifer Gonzalez. So maybe you are horrified mm. about all the things that Trump is doing in the U.S., but if you talk to them, they are not well informed, and they actually don't care that much. And that's part of the division and separation that's there between Puerto Rico and the U.S., that not only people from the new progressive party are uninformed, uninfo uninformed, but also Puerto Ricans in general because of our colonial situation. So there's gonna be a, a continue a continued disconnection between American and Puerto Rico, US and Puerto Rico's politics. Um, but in in summary, that that's what I see happening. And you know, there are so many other things that will continue happening. Um, yeah, and that's, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot happening in Puerto Rican politics. Some of it, I think, actually quite positive and at least hopeful. Um, and you know, maybe a, a good way to to start wrapping up is to is to talk about okay, we we focused on this one candidate, Jennifer Gonzalez. Um, you know, what are the other what are the other options <laughs> on the ballot for for Puerto Ricans? You know, we don't want to um, just leave people with only with only bad news. Um, so you know bad news a... <laughs> jennifer gonzalez is bad, is bad news <laughs> yeah that's a good that's a good podcast title too um <laughs> but uh you know as, as merari mentioned at the, at the beginning and as, and as many folks i'm sure will will know um 
it is a time of big change in, in Puerto Rican politics. You know, we used to have three parties. Now we have uh, six. Um, you know, you had the, the pro-status quo and, and pro-statehood parties completely dominating politics. And now, you know, it's an open question who will who will win the, the next election. Um, so, you know, I thought we could at least do a do a couple of, of minutes on, on the other candidates on the on the ballot as a way to look forward to to November. Um, the so I'll, I'll 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 give you the I'll give you the honor of, uh, of maybe some of the candidates that we like the most, uh, <laughs> but um, but um, the, I I remember you mentioned earlier in the conversation and, and we should talk about because if um, if all of this you know if Jennifer Gonzalez and, and Donald Trump et cetera sound incredibly you know conservative and, and concerning to you I am sorry to tell you that there is an even more conservative <laughs> party in, <laughs> in Puerto Rico now called Project Dignity, um, which is an explicitly, you know, Christian conservative party that cites, you know, God in its founding uh, documents and, and commitments. Um, their candidate for governor um, is, is Javier Jimenez, who, um, again, to the point of there's a lot of this conservatism in the in the pro-statehood party. Um, he's a former member of the the New Progressive Party. I always want to say so-called New Progressive Party because I just hate that the word progressive is associated with <laughs> with that party. But um, but with the statehood party, he's the the mayor of San Sebastián. Was elected, um, you know, from the pro-statehood party and, and switched parties recently to be able to to run for governor um, for this new Project Dignity Party. And and you know, it is a candidate and a party. That has, um, I think, all of the, all of the positions that you would expect a conservative Christian party to have, and and that you see in a lot of, uh, in a lot of corners of the of the Republican Party in the, in the U.S. as well, um, in the for the pro status quo party, uh, we have Jesus Manuel Ortiz, who's a current member of the of the Puerto Rican House of, of Representatives. Uh, so this is the the popular Democratic Party, which. Uh, much like the free associated states thing is a, a misnomer when you translate it. Um, the popular Democratic Party, not that popular anymore. So <laughs> so the, the unpopular Democratic Party, which um, again has been one of that 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 duopoly dominating Puerto Rican politics for for decades, um, now you know has been on on a steep decline. Um, and, you know, it's a party that is still there's still some divisions within the party um, between, you know, about the status and whether the, the status quo isn't colonial at all. There's actually people in that party who still believe that, who believe that it can be reformed, who believe that you can have a better relationship with the United States, you know, within the current territorial status arrangement. Um, I think most people recognize that those are sort of pipe dreams and you know the U.S. government has, has almost said as much for a long time, but that is still where the the pro status quo and, and their party and their candidate Jesus Manuel Ortiz stands um, at this at this moment. Um, and Merari, since you have interviewed him twice now, do you want to <laughs> say a few words about the other candidate for for governor in Puerto Rico? <laughs> what What can I say about Juan Dalmao? He's Juan Dalmao is running for governor of Puerto Rico for the pro independence party. Um, he won like 14% of the vote in the last 2020 election. And you might think that's not much, but you have to take into account that historically the pro-independence party has never gotten more than three to 4% of the vote. So something happened historically that Juan Del Mar ran in 2020 and won 14% of the vote. And so there are, there are some historic uh, historical shift happening, shift happening. I think you ha might have to listen to uh, an episode that's coming up that's called The Search of the Independence Movement, which is which talks about how the the in, in the the pro, the, pro, the the independence for Puerto Rico, independent the um, independence for Puerto Rico, the the pro independence party, and the left has been seen in a more positive light or lens in Puerto Rico, because in the past 20, 30 years, we have been uh, led by these two main parties. And what we have seen so far is that the quality of life in Puerto Rico have deteriorated or gotten worse 
some people are like, hey, wait a minute. And also, I think the situation with Hurricane Maria and Donald Trump mm -hmm. somehow made some people think more about our relationship with the U.S. and also become more critical of it and say, hey, there, I'm not going to die if I vote for Juan Dalmau. And the CIA and the FBI is not going to follow me if I vote for him because this is the culture of Puerto Rico. You know, the pro-independence movement has been uh, persecuted, oppressed by the FBI and by the U.S. Um, because the pro-independence movement somehow, you know, they are criticizing the way that and they're challenging the position of the U.S. of keeping us as a colony. So the U.S. felt threatened so things have been shifting throughout his, our, our history in Puerto Rico and somehow Juan Dalmao now got 14 percent of the vote but what we need to tell the audience is that Juan Dalmao is not running alone as and, and the political party that he represents is not running alone but they are running in alliance with the how did you translate it um uh victory the, movement yeah the citizens victory movement or movimiento victoria ciudadana yeah so they are not going to have somebody running for governor so that everyone who is following that movement votes for Juan Dalmau. And in 2020, the person that ran for governor from the Citizen Victory Movement also earned around 14% of the vote. And if we unite those 2%, 14 and 14 will be like 28. And um the actual governor won, run, uh, won with a 33% of the vote. So somehow there's there are some possibilities, some possibilities, and that Juan Demo could win the election. But in terms of his background, his background, he was a senator uh, uh, in Puerto Rico as well. He's an, he, was a, he has a Jewish doctor, I believe. Um, yes, former law professor and... And former political prisoner in a way, because he was one of the oh, many right. pro-independence uh, leaders who was in jail um, because uh, they were protesting the, the U.S. Navy in, in Vieques. Um, which also, I it's important to say that he's from Caguas, Puerto Rico. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm from San Lorenzo, so it's kind of like very close. So I had to say that. Yeah. Um, well, and listen, you know, we're not going to sit where we're. we're we're pro independence. We are, but but PR, but Equos Unidos is a pro independence organization. We are not going to pretend that we do not have our our sympathies in this in this race. Um, but again, we are not here to tell you who to vote for. If you are a Christian conservative, you know, in Puerto Rico, you should probably vote for <laughs> Javier Jimenez. That's who's going to represent you. If you love Trump and everything he stands for, there's Jennifer Gonzalez who you know loves and and supports him too. So you know, as always with with politics and with elections, um, it's just important for people to know who candidates are what they support who they support what they what they believe in and and make your choices accordingly um well i think we had a couple of questions in the chat here so maybe we'll we'll close with those um i know the first one from from sandra was you know what does jennifer gonzalez have in common with trump and with george santos i, mm -hmm. I think we've talked a little bit about what she has in common with with trump it's so hard to say what she has in common with george santos because who knows who george santos really was <laughs> i mean this is a man who who lied about everything in his life and in his background um we do know that jennifer gonzalez endorsed and supported george santos when when he was running as she you know does with most republicans because she is a republican um but yeah i mean i, I think we've said a little bit about um, you know, what, what Jennifer Gonzalez and, and Trump have in common. I do go back to this idea of kind of opportunism and, you know, the fact that she has even flip-flopped in her support for, for Trump. And I think we see in, in Trump someone who also, you know, takes whatever position is convenient that day. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. The same so... thing with Luma Energy. She did exactly the same, the same thing. Exactly. Like... That's a great example. She's you know, someone like, who no go ahead. <laughs> like one day she said we need to cancel the Luma Energy contract, and then the next day she says no, I think it's gonna be expensive for the Puerto Rican people. When people who are expert on Luma Energy says that contract can be canceled, is not necessarily gonna be expensive for the Puerto Rican people. Um. So yeah. somehow there is this flip flop that characterizes her. Yeah, it's the the famous line in politics. I, I was for it before I was against it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we we see a lot of that. Um, 
All right, and then there's this other question, which maybe you want to start answering, uh, Merari, because I know you've had a lot of interesting conversations with uh, with Kamala Harris fans about Puerto Rico and about and about statehood and and with Democrats in general. Um, so how how likely do you think uh, they would be to to consider statehood in a in a Harris administration? And you know, and we've been together in in Congress in Washington D.C. and uh, have uh, have had a lot of meetings and and conversations with members of Congress. Uh, Is, 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 are we going to be the 51st state if, uh, if Kamala Harris wins the election? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, I think they will sympathize with the idea of Puerto Rico becoming a state because of the idea of inclusion that the Democratic Party holds or, or you know, through all history. But um, I haven't seen anything meaningful being done by any president. Um, so I don't want to have my my hopes really high with this with this new administration either. So there is nothing that tells me at this point that Kamala Harris administration will 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 do anything about the status with the you know the status of Puerto Rico right now. Um, in terms of like ha talking to folks from the Kamala or Ka Kamala Harris um. um Uh, candidacy or like um, campaign uh, that was before she she was run you know it's not in, in this current campaign so that was before when she first was running for president um, I talked to different folks in her campaign to see if they could include Puerto Rico just to include uh, Puerto Rico in the in the you know platform but to the to the day that she uh, had to close or resign or With her campaign, there was nothing that was posted online. Um, they said they were working on it, but I never saw anything. Um, and I think they have actually now, just in the last couple of days, released a, a fact sheet or something on all of the um, the Biden Harris administration's uh, so called accomplishments when it comes to Puerto Rico. And you know, yeah, there's I saw that. that. And actually, yeah. I read that sheet to Juan Dalmao in the last interview some of the things that they said that it were their accomplishment and Juan Dalmo responded to that so if you want to hear that you have to go to the interview where of Juan Dalmo for that but yeah. yeah yeah and you know what it says in that um in the party platform now and in this fact sheet from the administration about Puerto Rico status is this line about Puerto Rico's self-determination which Again, it's a whole other two-hour podcast that we we should probably have. Um, but I think it's worth saying the Democrats have had every opportunity to, you know, support and push forward statehood for for Puerto Rico if they really wanted to mm -hmm. to do it. You know, as I mentioned in 2020, fresh off of statehood winning a plebiscite, fresh off of a pro-statehood governor and government being elected, you know, eight years of a pro-statehood you know resident commissioner in in washington you've had a lot of um pol democratic politicians at least kind of musing about statehood and mentioning it and, and this is some of what merari was saying there's a lot of talk and and no action um but they could have done this they could have pushed this in 2020 they could have taken you know the with with you know full control of, of congress um you know house senate and the presidency they could have said great statehood won the plebiscite we've been telling puerto ricans that you know when an option won a plebiscite with more than 50 percent, we would do it so let's do it and they did exactly the opposite and in fact they've gone backwards on on statehood um you know and it's now this language of self-determination which again is a concept that i at least agree with and <laughs> um and find you know important and, and valuable but i also recognize that it is becoming a bit of a a talking point and a euphemism and a let's just tell puerto ricans we support their self-determination and not actually do anything about it so you know i i, I continue to see very slim prospects for statehood Um, I mean, under a Republican administration, it's impossible because they literally think it's a socialist plot to destroy America. Um, and Democrats, I just simply think, have never shown a desire to put real political will behind it. And political will is what it would take, given the massive, massive Republican opposition and the need to get 60 votes in the Senate for it. So, um, you know, as, as we've talked about in a lot of other episodes and webinars and, and, and conversations um it just it doesn't seem like something that would happen under either 
administration, which is uh, one of the reasons why we don't support statehood. <laughs> because as long as it doesn't happen, Puerto Rico remains a colony and we are we are heading toward year 127. Um, well, and we are headed towards um, minute 80 of uh, of this conversation. So Merari, any final any final thoughts as we as we wrap up about Jennifer Gonzalez, about Trump, about this election, about about how you're feeling? <laughs> <laughs> We said this would be an informal conversation, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, at, we're we're living very difficult times in Puerto Rico right now, and there's there's a feeling of like. I I have mixed feelings, feeling hopeless that this is the candidate that might likely win, but also hopeful that that might not be, the case, or that if that's the case that there is a strong movement that's been building up uh, for the following election, because it takes a lot of time for movements to emerge and to become strong. And um, But I hope that, um, you know, things change for uh, in a positive way for Puerto Rico, which is what we all want. Um, yeah, I think that's such an important point. And I've, I've said this to people, you know, I think my, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, beyond our individual, <laughs> you know, views about it. There's a lot of young people, especially in Puerto Rico, placing their hopes on the Alianza and on Juan Dalmau's candidacy on an, an, an on a new vision for for Puerto Rican politics. Um, and you know, many of them are working very hard to make sure that that happens now in in 2024. It might not, right? Um, you know the the pace of change is, is sometimes slower than we would like it to be, as as you said, Merari. Um, I still think the change, the pace of ch political change in Puerto Rico is um, happening much faster than any of us would have imagined just a mm -hmm. few years ago. And I always tell you know Americans, especially, much faster than anything we could even imagine happening in the United States right now. At a time when people, a lot of people, <laughs> are similarly dissatisfied with the. Um, with the two-party system, you know, imagine a universe in which the Green Party or the um, or the Socialist Party or Cornell West or somebody actually was going to win, you know, 25, 30 percent of the vote in the U.S. election this November. That's that's unthinkable. And that's mm -hmm. that's the scenario that we're at in Puerto Rico, you know, and I think changes changes coming, um, whether it's in 2024 or 2028 and, and or beyond. And we need people to to keep working at it and, and not lose hope. Um, and I would say we need people to, you know, take a very hard look at <laughs> politicians like Jennifer Gonzalez to, to bring us back around to our, our topic um, and and think about what their support for someone like Donald Trump or, some, or in something like the Republican Party represents, you know, and, and if that really feels like something that is good for Puerto Ricans and that they feel like matches their, their values and, and our needs as a people. And, uh, everyone can can judge for themselves whether whether that's the case well thank you alberto for those important words and with that we're gonna end this webinar and we thank you for being part of this live podcast uh recording with uh, slash webinar and i hope to see you again in in the future i think we're gonna do more this is the last one from a series of webinars right alberto and we're gonna be doing more next year yeah, although uh, we always have uh, invitations out to, to interesting guests and people. So if somebody says yes, we'll, we'll put something together and uh, and we'll see you again this fall. There's certainly a lot more political conversations to have between now and the election. So stay tuned, budpr.org or our social media, you know, at budpr. Um, and we uh, will announce anything that's, that's coming up there. But um, thanks again for joining us. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you soon. Hey, take care, everyone.